Welcome, everybody. This is the Pacific War Podcast, week by week, and I'm joined here today by a very special guest, Chuck Myers, a carrier veteran of the U.S. Navy, a historian, a naval consultant for the 2019 Midway film, and possibly other films we might talk about <laughs> later. And he also works as a docent for the USS Hornet Museum. How are you, Chuck? I'm fine. Thank you, Craig. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I've been very excited for this interview for quite a while now. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. So let's have at it. What do you say? All right. I think by now, anybody who's clicked onto this knows the subject of the matter is, of course, the USS Hornet. And uh, perhaps we just want to start off. Do you want to say a little bit about yourself to uh, let the audience know who you are? Well, I'm an old guy. Um, to start with, I, I served in the Navy from 1961 to 1966. So all of you people out there who have basic arithmetic skills can probably figure out about how old I am. Um, I've been a, a, a docent on the Hornet uh, here in Alameda, California for the, the past 12 years. And uh, it's a little bit like wiping away 50 of those years and, and being back on a, on a carrier again, because the Hornet is for all intents and purposes identical to the, to the ship I served on Yorktown uh, back in the day, same mission, uh, same layout, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, being a docent. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I work with some really remarkable people who are also docents. Uh, and actually, we're, we're pretty ecumenical in the docent uh, arena. We have Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, uh, Coast Guard, and civilians as docents on the Hornet. Uh, so we cover most of the ground that can be covered in one way or another. So it's, it's sort of my passion uh, uh, and my avocation as well. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know I now have a Patreon account found at www.patreon.com slash the Pacific War channel. Over there you can find exclusive Patreon episodes and podcasts based on suggestions from patrons and other benefits like early access to all of my content, live hangouts, your name in the end credits, and much, much more. So please go check it out. So well, that's a little bit about me. All right. And I thought there was no better place to start than to talk about kind of the history behind the Hornet, which actually, I didn't know this, goes even uh, further back than World War II. It goes all the way to the Spanish-American War. Oh, it goes further than that. Uh, the first, yeah. uh, the first two Navy ships that the Continental Congress uh, bought in 1775 were named Hornet and Wasp. So it goes back all the way to 1775. And I've always told people that I thought Continental Congress had kind of an interesting uh, sense of humor. They sent two stinging insects out to fight the Royal Navy, which shows uh, either a lot of courage and chutzpah or, you know, uh, whatever else you can think of that would would replace those. And there's been uh, a total of eight hornets. So the, uh, yeah. we had hornets in the in the War of 1812. We had hornets in the actually before that in the uh, fight against the Barbary pirates. Uh, and then the last two ships named Hornet uh, are CV8 and CV12. So um, we uh, we have quite a, a long history. Uh, and in those days, um, just uh, for you know those who don't know it, there was a time when the Navy named uh, ships with a, a set of standards that uh, have been surpassed now. But uh, aircraft carriers were named after previous ships or battles. So Hornet was named after the seven Hornets that came before it. Yorktown, the one I served on, was named after the Battle of Yorktown. Of course. Now, of course, they're named after presidents and the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee, which tells you something, I suppose. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, battleships were named after states. Cruisers were named after cities. And it goes on and on. Oilers were named after Indian rivers, not just rivers, but Indian named rivers oh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the most interesting naming conventions was ammunition ships were named after volcanoes, which I thought was also kind of an interesting sense of humor. Oh, well, that's so, similar to how the Japanese did it in the world, well, it, it, before world war two. <laughs> in in some sense, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, the Hornet that I serve on is actually the, the hate the eighth Hornet that was um, placed in the service. And it was actually going to be named Kearsarge when the keel was laid. 
And uh, when the Hornet was the first aircraft carrier Hornet was sunk in October of 1942, they uh, changed the name of Kearsarge to to Hornet. Same thing happened with Yorktown, Wasp, and Lexington. By the yeah. way, we lost those those four carriers, and we named Essex class carriers after them. So, in effect, you, the uh, you, you had a, a situation where it was kind of um, spoofing the Japanese. Uh, they thought they sunk one, and what they got back was a bigger, uh, faster, uh, more capable uh, carrier than than the one that got sunk. So, naming actually, conventions are, were important at one point in time. It is actually quite humorous you mentioned that because the Japanese had routinely told their commanders they had sunk countless aircraft carriers yes. with, with false <laughs> information. I mean, both sides were guilty of claiming such things all the time, of course, but for the Japanese, you know, it actually really surprised them when these aircraft carriers showed up like at Midway. Well, and and, and in some cases, uh, you know, it, it's problematic because uh, the Japanese command tended to believe what they were told as opposed to uh, just the uh, PR that was being put out by the by the US Navy. But you're absolutely right about the fact that, you know, both um, both sides were uh, extravagant let's say in their uh, in their assessment of damage and 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 sinkings well i would have to say for my audience uh we did cover the doolittle raid but i think it's a great place to begin because for the cv8 it's uh if not it's i i don't know in comparison to the battle of midway i'd say it would be the first or second runner up for its greatest event that it was part of uh yeah um, and particularly if you if you actually measure hornet's contribution to the battle of midway um, it was um, not all that significant as it turned out but lackluster compared to the others yeah. too yeah including things uh, like the uh, so-called flight to nowhere uh, yeah. and we can talk about that if you're if you're really interested in it but um uh cv8 uh, was selected in uh, uh february of of uh, 1940 to uh, by Donald Duncan as a as the ship that was going to uh, Captain Donald Duncan, who worked on uh, Ernest King's staff, uh, to be the test uh, for uh, flying a B-25 off of uh, an aircraft carrier. So there were actually, uh, before a doodle raid itself, the, the Hornet was actually the ship that launched the first two B-25s that were flown by a couple of Army Air Force first lieutenants. Uh, both have Irish names, and I've forgotten one. One was Fitzgerald, and I can't remember who the other one was. It's not. It's not terribly important. But that was the, that was the proof of concept that yes, you could launch a B twenty five off of a of a Navy aircraft carrier, and it was interesting because if you think about it, the right wing tip of the B twenty five had six feet clearance on the on the right side, the the left front wheel uh, was had about six feet clearance uh, or it would drop off the side of, of the uh, carrier. So uh, you had to stay in a pretty much of a straight line when you were taking off. Uh, the Hornet actually uh, uh, received the, the B-25s uh, on April 1st, F April Fool's Day uh, in 1942 in San Francisco. Uh, the idea was they were going to put uh, 16 of the best of the 22 that actually flew from McClelland Air Force Base to Alameda that day. And the first of those was actually going to be flown off of the carrier once they got past the Farallon Islands on their way uh, west to Pearl Harbor or towards Pearl Harbor. They never actually went to Pearl Harbor. Um, and in the long run, they decided, well, we've got 16 of them on. We think we can launch 16 of them. So they decided to just keep 16 and, and take those on the raid. Um, you know, people know uh, quite a bit about the Doolittle Raid. One of the most interesting parts of, of the Doolittle Raid for me uh, starts back in uh, in 1940 with a guy by the name of Steve Jerica. Mm -hmm. Steve Jerica for the Doolittle Raid was the air intelligence officer on, on Hornet. But in 1940, he was a assistant air, uh, naval, assistant naval attache, I better get my terms correct. Uh, in Tokyo, and he actually spoke Japanese. He actually spoke Chinese, uh, one of the dialects of Chinese as well. Graduated from high school at age 14, joined the Navy wow. at age 16 because he couldn't get an appointment 
uh, to the Naval Academy since he was uh, living in the Philippines. That's where his family was from. He was he was a native born uh, American, but he, his family was in the Philippines. No congressman, no senator from the Philippines. So the only way he knew that he could get to the uh, Naval Academy was to join the Navy and pass the test, which he did. And he became a naval aviator and uh, and eventually was the uh, assistant attache in the, in the uh, American Embassy in Tokyo. He took it upon himself uh, as the attache, knowing what the, the uh, political circumstances were uh, between the US and Japan to, to take trips around Japan and play golf on all the golf courses he could find that were close to military or, or large industrial uh, locations and mapped out uh, on his own without anybody telling him uh, some of the things that would be targets if the US and the, and the Japanese ever went to war. Uh, he's a really fascinating character. As I said, he graduated high school at 14, went to, to schools in China and Japan after he graduated from high school. Um, after the, I'll just continue on Steve for a minute, and because I, I think he's such an interesting character. Um, after um, Hornet, he actually worked for Mark Mitcher at the Cactus Air Force on Guadalcanal for a while, um, was uh, famous for having taken a canoe ride between islands on, uh, while he was on Guadalcanal to uh, reconnoiter where the Japanese were going to do things next. He ended up uh, as a um, navigator on another Essex class carrier, actually won a Naval, Navy Cross for his actions in, uh, in response to a kamikaze attack, hmm. uh, ended up as, a, as the uh, commander of the ROT, NROTC unit at Stanford. Uh, when he, when he uh, retired, he became a he, got a PhD in political science and taught political science at Stanford for a long time. His brother-in-law was one of the uh, main guerrillas in the Philippines for many years. Uh, his mother was actually executed by the Japanese as a spy in the Philippines. So the Jerika family was, was really interesting. And, you know, most people don't really know a whole lot about Steve Jerika, but if you have an opportunity, uh, there's a, two-part oral history that's available about him from the Naval Institute, at least. And, you know, I think somebody is really missing the boat by not, um, by not uh, writing, writing a, book a book just about Steve Jerica. In fact, the next time I have a chance and see Ian Toll, I'm going to say, Ian, why didn't you write a book about <laughs> Steve Jerica? Because uh, it would be brilliant if he did that. Um, at any rate, uh, you know, some of the things that are, are interesting about um, the Doolittle Raid is, how it was planned, it was planned largely by Donald Duncan, who was a, a captain working for Ernest King. Uh, he interfaced with Hap Arnold, the, the uh, general that was in charge of the Army Air Force at the time. Yeah. Uh, actually wrote the plans for the Doolittle Raid on something like 30 pages of, of yellow legal pad. When, uh, when, uh, Halsey came back to the U.S. to uh, work with uh, Jimmy Doolittle and, and Mark Mitcher and, and company uh, about the raid. It was, I think, March 30th, if I remember correctly. Um, the 30 pages, and I'm not sure it was 30, but I believe that's what Donald Duncan says in his oral history, uh, he gave to uh, the guy who ended up being the uh, first captain of the CB-12, a guy by the name of Miles Browning, who was the um, oh, yeah. chief of staff to Halsey. Hmm. And those 30 pages of uh, legal pad have disappeared from history. It would be really interesting to be able to find those, but nobody seems to know what happened to them uh, hmm. after they after they uh, came into the possession of Miles Browning on the, at that meeting in San Francisco. Um, a lot of fascinating things about that. Then, you know, just to, to, to make some tie-ins that you don't normally do with a Doolittle raid, Donald Duncan then uh, was the commander of the USS Essex. So as a kind of a reward for what he did uh, in the Doolittle raid, he became the first captain of an Essex-class carrier, uh, went on to be an admiral uh, later in, in, in his career. So there are, oh, oh, by the way, uh, Donald Duncan's sister, Barbara, 
was married to Harry Hopkins, who was the uh, the main man uh, for for Roosevelt, his main okay. advisor, who actually lived in the White House. Uh, by the time of the war, she had she had died. But uh, you know, the, those if, if you think. Think about Washington in that time frame. Instead of being this massive thing that it is today, it was pretty. Close it was a pretty it, yeah. small town and close knit uh, relationship. So, uh, Duncan's kids recall playing in the, on the floor of the White House, for example. So, you know, this this is an kind of an interesting uh, group of people and and have had interesting relationships. At any rate, uh, one of the things that is often said about the raid is, uh, well, there are two things that, that sort of stand out. Uh, one of them is once the uh, once the, the uh, task force had been uh, seen by uh, the Nido Maru, some 700 miles off of Tokyo at the time, uh, the uh, cruiser uh, fired, I, I think the, the number is it's 943 six Missing inch. almost every single, yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> Now, 15 of those were to clear their guns, but, you know, 928 six-inch shells, and, and they still didn't really sink it. They, they got a help from a wildcat or two. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the interesting things. And the, the captain of the of that cruiser, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, was uh, uh, really uh, chagrined by the poor performance of his, <laughs> his gunnery crew. But on the other hand, if you think about the sea state at the time the Nido Maru was under going up, the, the waves and yeah. and yeah and so you know you can give him you can cut him a little slack on that. The other one is that uh, you know one of the things that uh, some people have said is that once the planes were launched, that Halsey cut out uh, because he was afraid he was going to be uh, found by the Japanese fleet. Mm -hmm. The reality is that. Uh, when the, the mission was decided upon in March, uh, Nimitz was ordered to provide the Enterprise as being the, the ship that, that covered the raid uh, with their aircraft. He was really planning on trying to ambush the, uh, the Japanese fleet at Coral Sea, and he would have used the three carriers uh, that he had at the time to do that, uh, Yorktown, Lexington, and, and Hornet. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting to speculate. Suppose we hadn't done the Doolittle raid, and suppose we had found uh, the uh, Kudo Butai at uh, Coral Sea instead, and and um, actually had a you know the midway before we had Mid midway. In midway, fact, yeah. yeah. Interesting to speculate what that would have been like. But reason Halsey was moving as fast as he could back to Pearl Harbor was he wanted to get in on the on the Coral Sea raid because he knew about it. Yeah. So the idea that uh, Halsey was uh, cutting and running is, uh, you know, is fantasy that some people have uh, perpetuated over time. Uh, but there are so many things that are are interesting about uh, Doolittle. But you know, I still my my thing is I would really like to to have met Steve Jerica because he's such a remarkable character and did such a good job of uh, selecting the targets that were. Uh, that, that were bombed or were intended to be bombed based on stuff that he did uh, mm -hmm. before the uh, there was even a, a hint of war. Uh, so um, I still think I'm, I'm, if I if, if I get a chance to talk to Ian Toll again, I'm, I'll make the point that you guys really ought to do justice to to that because it, he's such an interesting character and his family was such an interesting family. So that's you know kind of my my take on the Doolittle right now. Interestingly, uh, for the museum, one of the things that we uh, have tried to do and were successful in, in excuse me, we actually were. Uh, I, I'm not going to really say primarily, but we were one of the inspirations for the Congressional Gold Medal that was awarded to the. To the Doolittle Raiders, and uh, actually, the museum has a uh, was given a copy of the gold medal as well as being the successor of the uh, of CV8, and so we're kind of proud of proud of that. And we, we do have a lot of Doolittle Raid memorabilia, and, mm. and one of the things that was fun for me as a docent on the Hornet was uh, for the uh, 70th anniversary of the raid. We had five of the Raiders. Uh, Jimmy Doodle's son, 
and uh, his granddaughter, uh, Jana, on board. And uh, that was really something that the, the Raiders were uh, treated like rock stars at that thing. And they really kind of reveled. And I imagine they probably had that experience more than once. But, you know, I, I only saw it once. But it was kind of fun to to be able to relate to uh, to the Raiders. And we had uh, we had one of our um, one of our favorite people, a, a guy by the name of Rich Nowatsky, who was a uh, crew member on on CV8. Uh, he was a seaman at the time of the Doolittle raid, and uh, he, he's gone now at, at age 97. But uh, he tells a story about uh, he and his buddy going up and looking at the B-25s on the flight deck and, you know, marveling at them. And then they went to the to the rear of one of them and said, those are not guns, those are broomsticks that were sticking out of the of the uh, the rear. And, uh, you know, one of the pilots said, yeah, we needed to cut the weight as much as possible. And yeah. so they said, well, what, what have you got back there? And he, the, the pilot said, well, you have cameras. And they said, how do you operate the cameras? And he said, oh, we're gonna get, we're gonna look for volunteers. Uh, to operate the camera in the in the rear turret, uh, which was complete completely bogus. But you know, um, Rich and his buddy went uh, found out that Doolittle was a kind of an ice cream freak. He loved ice cream, and so they kind of stalked him in the ghee dunk until they found him eating ice cream, and asked if they could talk to him, and told him that you know they'd like to volunteer to be the camera operators in the B-25s when they did the mission and. Of course, Doolittle got a big kick out of that because uh, that wasn't going to happen, and you know his, he knew his his guys were fooling the fooling the sailors. So um, that was one of the um, high, highlights as well of of having the Raiders on board and hearing that hearing uh, Rich talk about his experience with Doolittle. So that's kind of what I know about the, the Doolittle raid. Oh, um, excellent. Well, I guess going from there, we could uh, just talk a bit about what happened at Midway for the Hornet, although it's not as uh, glorious as the other two aircraft carriers, of course. But I mean, the carrier was there. Well, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna add a little speculation because mm -hmm. the you know, um, like thinking about what would have happened if if we hadn't done the Doolittle raid and we'd gone to Coral Sea instead. Yeah. Uh, There's some things to think about. Um, Hornet uh, obviously was most famous uh, at the Doolittle raid for uh, what happened to uh, Torpedo Squadron 8. Torpedo Squadron 8 uh, actually found the Japanese carriers before anybody else did, and they were all shot out of the sky. And so um, they actually tried to attack the carriers, and uh, you know they were flying uh, TBDs, which could uh, when a torpedo run were going in very low at about 120 miles an hour. Yeah. And so we're almost sitting ducks. They ended up being um, shot up to the extent that only one survivor uh, remained out of uh, the those planes that, that attacked the uh, Japanese carriers. Uh, Anson George Gay by name. Um, and, and if you see it, if you've seen the movie Midway, he was portrayed as as kind of hiding under his seat cushion uh, while watching yeah. the uh, the battle, and I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, he he obviously was shot down. He obviously spent time under his his seat cushion, but whether he could see the battle itself or not uh, is is pretty much speculation. But it does make a good story, and it's been kind of perpetuated over time. Now, what happened to the rest of the Hornet squadron? Well, uh, this is what I believe happened to it. Um, Opring, who was the uh, air wing commander, uh, was told by Mitcher that, um, you know, we knew who were, he, he, Mitcher at the time knew where two of the Japanese carriers were, and his, his speculation was that they were in a two by two formation, so there would be two carriers behind the first two that we knew, and so he sent Stanhope Ring and his squadrons towards where he thought that, that uh, second a pair of carriers would be. Uh, that order was ignored by the commanding officer of the torpedo squadron because he didn't believe that's where he would find the Japanese carriers. And so he went off on his own and, uh, and ended up being one of the casualties. 
but Stanhope Ring and the rest of the Hornet squadrons, the tor the uh, SBDs and the Wildcats, all went on what's called the flight to nowhere. So they went off trying to find uh, the, the carriers far north of where they actually were at the time, and they didn't succeed in finding anything. Uh, in fact, they some of them uh, ended up uh, ditching because they they ran out of fuel. Yeah, ultimately. Fuel mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things about that so-called flight to nowhere uh, comes later, and that is that uh, Mitchner didn't write his report about the battle until about two weeks after it had happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, he may have gun deck some of that report. Uh, and I believe he did gun deck some of that report. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one of the things that um, you uh, you have to th think about is, well, why did somebody who had already been uh, selected for rear admiral uh, gun deck a report like that? And what would the result of that be uh, given the kind of person that Nimitz was? So mm -hmm. uh, I speculate and others have speculated as well that um, the reason that Mitra got sent to a hell hole like Guadalcanal to, to be the uh, air commander there uh, of the so-called Cactus Air Force was sort of uh, punishment by by Nimitz for not being uh, completely honest about his report at uh, uh, about the Battle of Midway and the so-called flight to nowhere. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's true and I, there's no way that anybody will be able to prove it, but given the, the personalities of the people involved, um, I think it's it's pretty interesting to think that you know that might have been Nimitz's response to okay, well you already got your two stars, but you're going to have to go spend six months on Guadalcanal to to make up for what uh, you you didn't do well at Midway, particularly that you didn't tell me the truth about what happened. Yeah. Um, as I said, speculation, but it's, it's something that I think is is an interesting speculation and makes history a lot more interesting if you can have a few of those kinds of. Of, of incidences so uh that that's where i come out on uh on the flight to nowhere now one of the things that was interesting for me is that you know i i actually had to, to bone up uh, quite a bit on the, the battle of midway uh just to make sure that i uh that i knew enough so that when uh, i was asked to come to montreal and work on the movie that i wouldn't embarrass myself too badly but most of it was really not uh, significant uh, whether I knew, you know, everything there is to know about Midway or whether I was just reasonably familiar with Midway, except for one incident I'll tell you about that was kind of kind of interesting. So when we were making the movie Midway, it was made in Montreal, and it was the the flight deck was built on a on a soundstage, allegedly the biggest soundstage in the, in America. And you may know it because uh, of where you're from. Yeah. And yeah, uh, it was about, um, the, the soundstage was, was long enough to have about a third of a flight deck built on it. I mean, lengthwise, it was completely, uh, it was completely big enough to have the, uh, the uh, flight deck in terms of its, uh, lateral size uh, from the flight deck to the to the uh, from the port to the starboard side uh, and it was it when they got when they when the production designer had finished it they built about a one and a half uh, levels of the island next to the flight deck and that was all facade so everything that you see that's above about the 04 level uh, the level above the flight deck in the movie is all CGI. But where I was sitting was watching this was uh, behind the director, actually behind the script supervisor of, uh, of, of the movie. And in front of the director, Roland Emmerich, were two large screens. They filmed this stuff in 8K. So you can imagine how much the, the amount of data that's that's stored for that is yeah. is absolutely astonishing but we were sitting there one day and there wasn't anything going on movie wise they were rearranging some things and to show 
to show you how much Roland Emmerich had studied Midway, there was a there was an extra in, dressed in um, in flight gear, standing where the cameras were looking right at him, and Roland kind of lurched out of his seat and he said, "Oh my God, that guy looks exactly like Jimmy Thatch." And I looked up and he did. This extra looked so much like Jimmy Thatch, who who was the fighter uh, guy on Yorktown. Uh, that it was just astonishing, especially when he had the you know the funny uh, leather hat uh, yeah. helmet on and and that kind of stuff. He he was a dead ringer for Jimmy Thatch, and we had no idea. Probably should have been filming on the Yorktown if we'd had a character that looked like that. But <laughs> at any rate, that's how that's how familiar uh, he was with with the Battle of Midway, which totally impressed me. Um, so my my contributions to the movie were in things like, well, the Navy doesn't salute when they're uh when they don't when they're not wearing a hat and and things like that so uh it, it was a great deal of fun for me uh they they listened to almost everything i uh, i said uh with with one exception which led roland to think that we probably ought to have a, a t-shirt for the movie that says chuck it's a movie <laughs> so but i'll give you a couple of those if you're interested in hearing sure. some of the some of the things that that happened well, I'll tell you the one that the, the first one that uh, that he said, well, I'm not going to do that. So, Chuck, it's a movie. There's a scene in the wardroom where um, Dick Best and, and his uh, SBD squad are, are having breakfast before the battle. And interestingly enough, uh, Ed Skrine, who was uh, who was playing Dick Best, must have eaten uh, close to 10 bowls of oatmeal that day because they shot the scene so many times for various and sundry reasons or nothing nothing that probably would have uh would have gotten the attention of the rivet counters but at any rate behind uh best sitting in the in this wardroom there was a porthole that was that was open and, the, and there was light coming through the porthole and at some point in time i said roland that light has got to move up and down a little bit because the the, the, the carrier is moving it's going to be rolling a little bit. It's going to be bobbing a little bit. Yeah. And he, he looked at me, he said, that would cost me several million dollars. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so that was the one that gets Chuck at some movie from it. But uh, I'll give you one that was that was the most fun for me. First of all, uh, when we were filming, uh, not on the flight deck, those were uh, the stuff that was done in the um, on the bridge uh, in flag plot, et cetera, et cetera were all done on on other sound stages and they had built uh, these structures to to do that and I'll and I'll, I'll digress just uh for one second the very first day I was on the set I was called up to the flag plot so I had to mount up a, a number of stairs and I walked in and here's Roland and Dennis Quaid and the guy that played Miles Browning uh Eric I can't think of his last name anyway uh, but what impressed me was that sitting on the chart table next to uh, Dennis's position was a package of Lucky Strike cigarettes, okay? <laughs> Lucky Strike cigarettes in 1941, the package was green. It was not white. So it was a red dot on a green package. All right. There was there was when I was a small boy, there was a commercial radio commercial that said Lucky Strike Green has gone to war. So they stopped using the dye to make the paper green so they could use that for uniforms, uh, olive drab or whatever. Okay. And they had the green package of cigarettes sitting there on the on the table. And that that just almost blew me away because they were so precise about what they were doing. So I was I was really impressed from the very get go about how much they wanted this thing to be as accurate as it possibly could be. Uh, but at any rate, uh, at some point in time, you may remember in the movie, Halsey goes down to the wardroom and he wants to talk to uh, McCluskey and Best. And so uh, Dennis, uh, there was a ladder built uh, coming uh, into one of the entrances to the, to the wardroom. And Dennis comes down the ladder, walks into the wardroom and he's wearing his, uh, his hat. I said, oh, time out. We uh we got to change that. Uh, he's got to take his hat off when he goes in the wardroom. And Roland says, "Why?" I said, "Because that's why the Navy does things. You know, it's traditional. 
Well, but he's an admiral. Can he do anything he wants? Yeah, he can do anything he wants to, but trust me, he's going to follow the tradition and take his hat off. So uh, Roland says, okay. And so Dennis goes back up the ladder, comes down the ladder, sticks his hat in his belt, just like he should without having been told that, and walks into the wardroom. Somebody says, attention on deck. Everybody jumps up and salutes. I said, okay, time out. Navy doesn't salute when they're uh, not covered. So they, they aren't going to salute. They're going to stand at attention. Dennis is going to say something like, as you were, and then we'll continue the thing, and he can go talk to McCluskey and Best. So Dennis comes down the ladder, puts his hat in his belt, walks in, and somebody says, attention on deck. They jump up and salute. And I say, okay, time out. No saluting. Uh, they don't do that. Okay. I convinced Roland we couldn't have him saluting. <laughs> Excuse me. So third time we film it, uh, he comes in, uh, does this thing, everybody jumps to attention. He says, I want to see McCluskey. As you were, I want to see McCluskey and Best. And they all sit down again. I said, okay, time out. Any junior officer I have ever met in the Navy, including me when I was a junior officer, if an admiral came into the wardroom and wanted to talk to somebody and I was there drinking coffee and you know smoking a cigarette or whatever, and the admiral's in the wardroom, I'm going to get the heck out of Dodge right now, soon. So that's the way we filmed it. You know, he goes to talk to McCluskey and Best and all of the guys leave the wardroom. Excuse me. Um, I'm getting emotional about this. I'll have a drink of water here. <laughs> no problem. So, but it was a <clears throat> it was a great experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was a great experience, and I'm I'm really glad I I got to do it. And it just happened because the guys that were uh, making the movie, Roland, and one of the executive producers and the production designer, a guy by the name of Kirk Petroselli, who I have immense respect for because of how faithful he was to the construction of the enterprise for the for the movie came to the hornet uh because they were doing a you know location visits see if they, they were thinking about actually shooting some of it on the hornet oh okay so i showed them around for about two hours and uh they said thank you very much and and went away and we didn't hear anything about it for for months so we thought well I, you know so much for that well, then we got another call. They said, well, we'd like to come back and do some more touring and, and you know, maybe we can set up some shots and things. And so they came for the second uh, tour and we did things like we went into a ready room and said, okay, if they were, were doing a briefing in the ready room, here's how we do it and so on and so forth. And um, I guess we probably spent about three hours that time going from place to place to place, uh, trying to see how they would shoot the movie. I, you know, that's, my, that's what I surmised. I, 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 I wasn't, you know, enough of, of a movie buff to know exactly what their intent was, but that's yeah. what it looked like. And then they disappeared again. You know, we didn't hear for several weeks. And then one day I got a, a, an email from the executive producer said, how would you like to come to Montreal for three weeks and help us make the movie? And so I, you know, it was, I was blown away. <clears throat> Didn't really know what to think, but it was a great experience. Um, and Craig, you're a Montreal person, right? So, you know, I spent three weeks at the Place d'Armes down in uh, downtown Montreal, which is a fairly uh, classy hotel. Yeah. Uh, about, about a block and a half away from Notre Dame Cathedral, uh, mm -hmm. down there in the central center of Montreal. Yeah, it's right in the heart and city. Driver uh, to the set every day, probably picking me up at 6.30 every morning. And that's, how, that's the work day. And then you end up going back to the hotel at, at eight o'clock at night, having spent 13 or 14 hours on the set, but you, you didn't, it didn't feel like that. It was, it was so interesting as an experience and the people were so good to me. Um, I think they thought they were going to break me for one thing. So if they didn't treat me really well, I'd, I'd break and, and, and fall into pieces and things, but it was an ex exceptional experience. Excellent. So, you know, that's, uh, and then, you know, uh, it was, it was a little bit like, well, I was a, I was a, a watch officer, a bridge watch officer on the, on the Yorktown when I was uh, in the Navy. And 
So it was a little deja vu all over again in, in a lot of respects, you know. And it was kind of an extension of the deja vu that, that serving on the Hornet for the last 12 years has been, um, but in a different way, in, in, in an exceptionally interesting way for me. So I've waxed eloquent for, for all this time. I'm sure you must have some questions or some topic that you'd like to talk about that I, that I haven't waxed eloquent about well i think uh well we've dabbled uh, very much into uh, the cv8 and of course uh, as everyone knows the hornet cv8 ends up getting sunk uh, by old santa cruz but is soon replaced as you mentioned by the cv12 which gets renamed and is now the hornet and i know it has an extensive career and myself one thing i really didn't know about was uh its venture with the uh with the space program that it was receiving the uh, capsule when the uh, when the astronauts had come back from the moon. I thought that was incredible that it was part of that. To uh... well, then, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, sure. In uh, 1969, uh, the Navy. I think I think in 1968, the Navy had actually made the decision that uh, Essex class carriers were not worth keeping around because mm -hmm. uh, they they were not um, up to speed with regard to the way. Uh, yes. carriers were then being built. So the Forrestal class had come along and, you know, they, they were thinking about you know, things beyond the Forrestal class at that point in time. So uh, when the Hornet came back from its tour in Vietnam in, uh, in 1969, uh, it was selected to uh, pick up the Apollo 11 astronauts. Now, you have to back up a little bit. In 1966, the Hornet actually picked up an Apollo capsule that had been uh, launched without any uh, without any astronauts. Oh, it was okay. one of the tests of the Apollo capsule in, in 1966, mm -hmm. and we have that capsule on the Hornet now. It was actually uh, oh, flown cool. in uh, in uh, that test, and then later it was taken and uh, it uh, it was used to determine what would happen if it had to land on uh, Mother Earth as opposed to in the ocean. They had deliberately designed it to land on the ocean because they could make it lighter then and, and they, could, they could get more mileage out of it. Yeah. So they dropped this, uh, this capsule <clears throat> on Mother Earth. And uh, if you go around behind it, it sits in Hangar Bay 2 on the Hornet. And if you go behind it, you can see there's a big crunch area that uh, to, it proved that it could actually survive a drop on, on Mother Earth. But uh, its crush or crumple zone uh, it shows uh, very prominently on that capsule. So that was 1966. So the Hornet had some experience in, in, in actually picking up an Apollo capsule, but then when it was, uh, it was determined that Essex was gonna go out of service and it was coming back from its third tour of duty at, uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, it was selected uh, as the recovery ship for Apollo 11 and so, uh, it picked up Apollo 11 on uh, July 24th, uh, 1969, uh, and it followed that up by picking up the Apollo 12 astronauts on November 24th, 1969 as well, and then went into, uh, it actually was retired in, in June of 1970 and put it in mothballs in Bremerton, but, you know, we tell people that uh, we have a lot of, a lot of things on the Hornet that are memorabilia of the Apollo program, including, and it's contemporaneously interesting now, uh, I think, uh, we have the only mobile quarantine facility you can actually walk oh. up and touch. So we, we yeah. ended up getting the, the MQF from Apollo 14 as, uh, as one of the displays that's on the Hornet. So the, there's one in the Smithsonian, you can't get too close to it, but the one on the Hornet, you can actually touch and, and uh, when we have special events, we actually let people walk into it and take a look around in the mobile quarantine facility. Uh, so we have the uh, uh, the Apollo uh, capsule, we have the Apollo mobile quarantine facility, and we have a lot of, of, of other memorabilia of uh, the Apollo program. So we tell people that the first four men that walked on the moon took their first solid step back on earth on the Hangar Bay 2 of, of the Hornet. Yeah. We have all of that. and uh, I mentioned that we had a gold medal for the um, for the <clears throat> Doolittle raid. Doolittle we also raid. have the gold medal that the congressional gold medal that was awarded to the Apollo program as well, and as we were a part of a uh, significant part of that. So there's uh, there's lots of uh, of interesting 
uh, World War II connections and then the space program connections that we have uh, with regard to the museum itself are all there as well. An, inc an incredible surface record for this uh, aircraft carrier. And it spans a long amount of time to include the Vietnam War. Space Three program. tours on Yankee Station in the Vietnam War, yes. Incredible. Yeah. The thing that when I think about the, the Hornet CV-12, the first thing, of, of course, that comes to my mind is the, you know, the incredible battle, of the, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the, the turkey shoot. As it's turkey shoot, about. yep. Yep. Mariana's turkey shoot. A very uh, unfortunate event for the Japanese pilots, of course, but uh, an incredibly, an overwhelming battle for, for people to try and understand how many ships were involved in this and the amount of aircraft. It's uh, certainly incredible. And just, just for the, uh, the Hornet, the, uh, the amount that the Hornets pilots and their anti-aircraft crews had shot down was pretty impressive as well. <laughs> yeah, the Hornet claimed, uh, I think, claimed 52 aircraft uh, during the Marianas turkey shoot. Um, uh, one of the interesting things to me is that uh, the Hornet actually had two aces in a day uh, yeah. during the, the, the turkey shoot, one of whom was an ensign uh, by the name, was, his real name was Wilbur, but he was called Spider Webb. Uh, and it's famous because, uh, among other things, uh, at, at some point in time, and I don't know if I can quote him 100% uh, accurately, but it goes something like this. He broadcast to... Uh, uh, in the clear to his aviator friends that he had, uh, he personally had 40 Japanese airplanes surrounded and been asked for a little help. Uh, he ended up shooting down six aircraft that day and, and uh, received the Medal of Honor as, uh, as a result of that. Uh, and a lieutenant uh, who is, I'm not sure if I can pronounce his name because I've never actually heard his name pronounced. I just have to read it like it is. It was Reeser, I think, Reeser, -er, two E R E R, the end of it. Anyway, he shot down five as well. And uh, so of the of the 52 aircraft claimed by the Hornet that day, uh, which was part of the 1410 that the Hornet claimed over the course of their service in the in the Pacific. Uh, 11 of those were shot down by by those two aviators uh and you know the whole that that whole battle is is you know amazing in a whole lot of ways and and later lady golf was almost as amazing in a lot of ways because oh, yeah. for one thing two of the admirals in both of those in those battles philippine sea and lady golf didn't even talk to each other they were part of the the two task forces and they didn't speak to each other they hated each other's guts <laughs> Uh, Karita and Ozawa, as I recall, were the two, and uh, they were both involved in, in both of those battles. But yeah, uh, the Hornet was uh, was uh, involved in a, in a lot of the uh, Marianas campaigns, Guam, Iwo Jima, uh, Saipan, <clears throat> and actually, uh, Hornet was never really damaged during World War II to any significant. Effect. I mean, you, you say never really damaged is, is a relative term because obviously it was strafed and, and but it was never hit by a bomb. It was it was hit by a torpedo that didn't explode, so it was a pretty lucky ship. But interestingly enough, uh, during the uh, Okinawa campaign, by the way, I should I should backtrack. Um, Hornet CV-12 was the first carrier uh, to have bombed. Uh, the Tokyo area after the Doolittle raid. Oh. So Hornet and Hornet were were inter were involved in that, and that was one of the things that did. And that was during the time of the of the Okinawa campaign. Uh, during that period of time, there was a, a typhoon off of Okinawa, and the and the ships scattered yeah. to, to get out of it. It was one pictures. of one of Halsey's typhoons. Uh, Hornet uh, actually uh, was damaged uh, significantly by the by the uh, uh, wind and, and sea, they had uh, you know 60 foot waves, uh, among other things. And the, the way the uh, carriers were designed, and it was a known flaw, or it was a known possible flaw, the flight decks went out over the bow. So the mm -hmm. flight decks were supported, uh, were not integrated with the bow of the carrier like they are now. And so the, the seas that were coming up under the flight deck stressed the metal enough that was supporting the flight deck that they it ended up 
with two dog ears of about 25 feet of flight deck on uh, on either side of the of the bow and the hornets actually stayed in the in the fight for three days they they, they tried to launch aircraft mostly which were uh, almost all aircraft at that time were, were deck launch they didn't use catapults to any significant uh, degree during uh, most of world war ii but uh, when they were deck launched with those uh, those two dog ears, there was such a vortex created at the bow that the three aircraft uh, had difficulty getting into the air. And they said, okay, time out. We don't want to do that anymore. So the Hornet started uh, actually launching its aircraft for those three days by backing down. It could do about 18 knots backing down. And if, if there was enough wind uh, in, in the right direction, that they would actually be able to launch aircraft. But eventually they discovered that well, we probably just ought to let those aircraft go to other carriers and go back to, to San Francisco and, and get it fixed, which is what it ended up happening. So Mother Nature did far more damage to the Hornet than anything that the Japanese threw at it during its uh, 14 months in, in battle. By the way, one of the interesting things as well is that once the Hornet left the West Coast and and stopped first at Ulysses with a lot of the other uh, ships in the in the Pacific at that time. It was never in port for 18 months, so it was at Anchorage at Ulysses and other places, but it was never in a port for 18 months during that that period of time, which, you know, in my experience would have been really dramatic because uh, you know even when I I did two Westpac cruises on Yorktown and uh, you know if we'd been out to sea for 18 months, I think I would have probably gone absolutely bonkers, but uh, mm -hmm. those guys uh, did it and, and seemed to enjoy it. So, but Hornet was a was a lucky ship, except for that that typhoon that, that got it in June of 45. Yeah, it's inc it was an incredible when I first saw the picture of the damage that, <laughs> that wind and, and the ocean could do such a thing to metal. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting what happens out there. I, I rem I'll tell you a sea story. Oh, sure. um, I was a I was the officer of the deck on Yorktown uh, one time when we were in somewhere in, in in the Western Pacific and I don't remember where we were at the time but it was a it was on the four to six watch in the in the afternoon so most watches are four hours long on the bridge but the but the watch between uh, four and and eight p.m. is is divided into two we call them dog watches so first dog watch is four to six second dog watch is six to eight and that's set up that way so the the watches both watches can have dinner in a reasonable manner so i had the first dog watch and as the officer of the deck and uh, we're out there at very calm uh, nothing going on we weren't launching aircraft uh, it was just one of those days when you're you know not not doing a whole lot and all of a sudden in directly in front of us was a uh, 70 foot wave it was one of those rogue waves that you hear about and we were fortunate because well we saw it from quite a ways away but we were fortunate that we were headed almost directly at it and so we altered our course a little bit so that we actually did uh, go directly into it and we took green water over the bridge of the carrier so now the to, to get, give you a perspective the bridge of of yorktown like hornet is about 450 feet from the bow Wow. And it and it at my eye level standing on the bridge were 83 feet above sea level. So that's where my eye level was on the bridge. And we knew that because we had we, we could determine from that height how far we could see to the horizon. We took green water above us over the bridge of the carrier. <laughs> wow. And so it was kind of like wow. And so was the captain. And he after it had happened, he turned and said, uh, some expletive I have never seen green water over the bridge of a carrier before. And I said, well, Captain, that's two of us, you know. Here's what happened. I So uh, everything kind of calmed down. We didn't have any any particular damage or anything. It was just an interesting experience. <clears throat> but when I went down to uh, have dinner at, at six after I was relieved, everybody thought I had hit something. Uh, and asked me, what did you hit? And I didn't hit anything because when we hit that wave, it was like we had hit a sandbar or something. We slowed down perceptively. And then we went through the water and, and came out the other end. Turned out that the only damage we had on the on the on Yorktown that I that I know of to this day was because of the time and because we had an admiral and staff on board, 
uh, the admiral's stewards were setting up for dinner in the admiral's uh, uh, spaces, and they had his china cabinets open when we hit that wave, and we busted a whole lot of the of the admiral's china as a result of that really slow down all of a sudden kind of a thing. So. The uh, Pacific is uh, allegedly calm, but you know there's some really interesting things that happen out there, including typhoons and rogue waves. We never did know what the what the genesis of that wave was. It was just there. Wow. So we went into it. Incredible. For a carrier to go through like that, that's yeah. certainly a large wave. What what I really regret is we in, in that uh, configuration uh, I described with an admiral on board. The reason we had an admiral on board was because we operated with eight destroyers as a hunter ki hunter killer group looking for then the biggest threat to the U.S. Navy were Soviet submarines, and that's what our uh, that's what we were tasked with was finding and and if it came to that killing Soviet submarines. So we had eight destroyers with us. And I, you know, I, I to this day do not know what they experienced on the destroyers, but you can imagine those things. Wow. You know, in, a, in a, any kind of a sea state, they're half submarine and half airplane. And I, I, I don't know what that looked like when they hit that wave. And I regret that. It's not my 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 specialization, uh, modern more modern warfare, closer to the Vietnam era. But when I was looking up the uh, the CV twelve, a uh, a large reason for the there was changes in basically how they were running aircraft carriers, specifically because of the innovations of the Soviet submarine program. It basically dictated how carriers were going to operate later on. I believe in the sixties, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the, the 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 main thing that happened was that uh, as we um, as we got further into the Cold War in the late fifties, uh, the Soviets were building an awful lot of diesel submarines at the time, mm -hmm. and they were fairly capable, uh, but they uh, they had a number of flaws. One of them was that they were diesel submarines, so they had to come up for air periodically, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so the Navy converted a number of Essex class carriers to uh, to operate as hunter killers. And what they put on them were uh, helicopters that had dipping sonar and uh, a plane called the S-2 Tracker uh, built by Grumman. And the things that were on the S-2 were, it had, first of all, it had a an, an amazing searchlight on it, a two, two million candle power, power searchlight so that it could, when it was flying at night, it could, you know, presumably spot periscopes or periscope wakes and things like that. Uh, it also had a magnetometer boom tail on it. And so the S2 was designed to, to fly reasonably low over the surface of the water with the magnetometer tail extended. And if it detected a magnetic anomaly below the surface, then it would track over that several, several different ways, calling other aircraft to do the same thing. And if they were convinced that they had a submarine, they then would drop sound buoys from the from the aircraft. The, the engine pods had a had a uh, sound buoy. Um, I don't know what to call it dispenser, for lack of a better word, to come okay. to mind, so that they could drop sound buoys in about a three thousand yard circle around the the datum for the submarine. And then they prosecuted that. Uh, they could call in helicopters as well. The helicopters, generally speaking, uh, did not ping, but they listened for uh, the submarine sounds. And one of the flaws of the Russian submarines uh, up until quite recently really was that they made a lot of noise. And so we could, uh, you know, even, even in today's world, a really good sonarman on uh, a U.S. Navy ship can say, oh, that's the USS Kursk. And the reason I know that is because it has this funny sound in it, some water pump or something like that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's really it's really almost bizarre. But uh, so that we would use helicopters or the the S-2s with uh, sauna buoys to uh, isolate where the submarine was. And then if we were uh, if we were going to go to war, then we would prosecute that. And one of the interesting things that um, I got to see as a result of the kind of carrier we were was <clears throat> when the Soviets started testing atmospheric uh, testing of nuclear weapons in 1962, mm. uh, we decided we'd do the same thing. And the Yorktown was part of a task force that was involved in those nuclear tests. And one of those was the first and only, as far as I know, 
uh, nuclear depth charge that was ever detonated. So for that, I was uh, on Yorktown and we were about 11,000 yards from, uh, I don't know, what do you call it if it's not ground zero, if it's in the sea, C zero, I don't know. Zero, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the way that worked was uh, one of the destroyers had a weapon called ASROC and ASROC was a rocket launched uh, device that could either carry a nuclear depth charge or a homing torpedo, depending on how you decided to, that you were gonna prosecute the submarine. And in this case, we deliberately were using, a, supposedly from inventory, a nuclear depth charge. So the destroyer Agarholm fired at a sled that was on a 3000 yard cable towed by a uh, US submarine. And <clears throat> when that thing went off, as I said, we were about 11,000 yards, so five and a half uh, to six miles away from uh, ground zero. Um, as soon as the explosion took place, um, well, my my general quarter station was at Secondary Con, and Secondary Con is right at the bow of of, of Essex class carriers, and it has actually six ports that go across the the front of the bow. As soon as the as we felt the the detonation the surface wave that came from the detonation, we got to open up those ports and you look out and you see this column of water that was about a thousand yards in diameter and it was about a thousand yards in the air. And you could see that there were a couple of helicopters up there. And of course that much displacement of air caused a lot of air turbulence as well. And so they're bouncing up and down and uh, we were kind of interested, but what we weren't expecting was there was an echo from the explosion that bounced off the seafloor and came up under Yorktown and lifted us about a foot in the air. So all of a sudden we're off our feet for oh, wow. just a brief period of time because of that bounced echo that came up under the under the ship. So that was a really interesting experience to see that we we were wearing I think three dosimeters and uh, that sort of thing, so that we uh, were trying to figure out how much radiation we were going to take as a result of that and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, on, on Yorktown, we carried uh, nuclear depth charges as well as conventional depth charges so that we could prosecute Soviet submarines. And the, and the game was, if you found one, you played with them until they had to come up and snorkel and get air and then you've won the game, you know, so. But that was the, that was the deal. A lot of, uh, a lot of Essex class carriers were converted to uh, the CVS in, 12 or 10 for me uh, is anti-submarine. That's what the S stands for. So uh, a lot of them were were put into that class of, of carriers back in the day. Did you win any interesting games? Well, we won a few, but you know, uh, when we, I'll, I'll tell you another uh, submarine story. Sure. We were, uh, one of the things that we, we did periodically is we, we, we played with our own submarines to see if they could if they could kill the carrier with its eight destroyers. And uh, uh, as far as I know, they won all of those games. Our guys won, our submarines won all of those games, as far as I know. Wow. You know, we'd say, well, no, you didn't get close enough. And they'd show us a periscope picture that, you know, we'd be on a porthole. Oh, boy. <laughs> so they were pretty close. Uh, so uh, in one exercise, the second time we, uh, for me, going to uh, Western Pacific is, uh, we had what was called an opposed sortie going from San Diego, where we picked up the air group, uh, to Pearl Harbor. And out there, there were supposed to be two nuclear submarines that didn't know what we were going to do, but were supposed to find us and, and kill us. And our, our objective was to get to Pearl Harbor without having them kill us. So uh, we had an admiral on board because, as I said, we had eight destroyers with us. And so we have a task group. And... Uh, so he, what he decided to do was he put four destroyers in a screen around three destroyers back to back to back, five, I'm sorry, five destroyers, and then three uh, going back to back to back. So it looked like the conventional formation of a, of a carrier group with the, with the surrounding uh, destroyers protecting the carrier. They went on one course and we went on a different course as fast as we could go. So the Yorktown was doing about 32 knots or 33 knots for a long time headed to Pearl Harbor. And at that speed, the fantail is, is fluttering, uh, you know, quite a bit. It's really, it's really noisy and it's really, there's a lot of vibration. 
we made it, but as the officer of the deck, when we, when we got to Pearl Harbor, we were still doing 32 knots when we went through the, the submarine nets at Pearl Harbor. So I had to back the engines of the Yorktown down quite a, for, for quite a length of time as we came into Pearl Harbor and made the right turn to go to our anchorage or our, our pier uh, on Ford Island. And I have never told the, uh, the Honolulu Chamber of Commerce this, but we made Pearl Harbor muddy for about two weeks because those engines were churning backwards as we're trying to, to get our speed cut as we went through the subnets. But we made it. They didn't catch us, and so that was the objective of the of the exercise. Wow. <laughs> I'm curious. Do you have um, when it comes to the Pacific War? Is there anything uh, that's particularly the most fascinating event to you? Uh, have you ever had your uh, the favorite event or maybe favorite battle? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I I still uh, like Midway for all of uh, for all of its mystery. You know. How uh, how McCluskey found the carriers and and you know uh, just everything about Midway is fascinating to me to this day. Um, you know a lot of people say it was luck. Um, I I uh, was asked uh, about a year and a half ago uh, to edit a book, a new book about the Battle of Midway. Oh, uh, and it's called uh, the uh, Silver Waterfalls, written by Silver, a professor yeah. at Cambridge University and his PhD student. And so they came aboard Hornet and, and uh, talked to us about Midway. And, and actually in the library on Hornet, we found uh, at least uh, two books that they had they were not aware of that were about Midway. In fact, one of them uh, was probably the first book and its title escapes me at the moment, but uh, probably the first book that was written about Midway in, in 1944 and our copy uh, was autographed by Ray Spruance, so it was kind of a oh, it was wow. kind of unique. And then because I was uh, because I was in the, at the movie, one of the things that I knew about was um, uh, let's see, I have to back up a little bit. When we were making the movie, I met uh, Luke Kleintank, who played Dickie Dickinson in the movie. And his question for me, as it turned out, was was fortuitous for the reasons of this book that I'm talking about. He had a book by Dickie Dickinson called Flying Guns, which is a pretty obscure book. Hmm. And he was asking me questions about uh, Dickie Dickinson and his relationship with Dick Best because he doesn't really talk about that at all in the in, in the book. And so Luke Kleintank was trying to figure out, you know, how should I play my role as a, as a supposed buddy of Dick Best when in point of fact, he doesn't even hardly talk about Dick Best in his book. And I told him I couldn't answer that question, but I, but I was interested in finding out that, that Dickinson had written a book. Well, that was, that was the second book that these, uh, these two, uh, two from Cambridge were unaware of. And so uh, the, the silver waterfall is kind of a different take on Midway. And, and I enjoyed being part of it because uh, the premise that, that the Cambridge guys have is that, you know, yeah, there was some luck involved and so on and so forth. But the real reason that the, the U.S. won the Battle of Midway was because uh, Ed Heineman built a really good airplane in the SBD dive bomber. It had features on it that nobody else had, like dive brakes and things like that. And it was really a, an excellent dive bomber. And we had trained our pilots uh, during the course of, of time from, say, 1936 on uh, to use it properly. And so the, the fact of the airplane being as good an airplane as it was, the fact that we had trained our aviators to the extent that we had uh, was, uh, and because we had the kind of leadership that we had in uh, Nimitz and Spruance in the case of Midway and Halsey as well, uh, those were the, the principal factors in, in uh, the, the victory at the Battle of Midway. And so the Silver Waterfall is all, all based on the fact that, again, we'll go back to uh, Jimmy Thatch. Jimmy Thatch uh, was quoted after Midway as, as seeing the dive bombers coming in looking like they were a Silver Waterfall. And so that's, that's wow. the title that the, these two, two uh, academics from, from Cambridge. It's the only book I've ever... Uh, been involved in that had 867 footnotes at the time I was looking at. Wow! It. <laughs> wow! But it, yeah. it it is an excellent read, and uh, you know, so uh, 
I, there's there's no royalties involved for a hornet or for me, but it's it's it is a different take on Midway, and it's a it's a worthwhile book. Uh, you'll find it, um, you know, in places like Amazon. So there and there is a novel called Silver Waterfall as well. So you have to be careful which one you're buying. But they're both about Midway, by the way. Huh. Uh, both based on the same premise that J uh, Jimmy Thatch said it looks like a, a silver waterfall. So Midway Midway remains the the most fascinating thing to me. Um, but you know it was interesting. Uh, some oh year two years ago during during the still during the uh, pandemic, uh, we had Ian Toll on uh, a Zoom call for uh, Hornet and. One of the questions I asked him, I said, you know, people ask me all the time, what was the um, turning point in the Pacific War? And uh, and I said, I will tell you what I think, and I'd like to hear what you think. And a lot of people say, well, Midway was the turning point. And my my mm -hmm. thesis is that the turning point was December seventh, nineteen forty one, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That oh, was the wow. end of the yeah. that was the end of the the Imperial Japanese Navy and the and and the uh, government of Japan at that point in time, because they shouldn't have done that. Oh, it certainly And they was. were destined to lose for sure. Oh, they knew. <laughs> it, 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 most of the high command were completely aware that they could not win the war. The, the, most opt the most optimistic viewpoint of Yamamoto or other members of the high command was that they would somehow have a miracle where the United States would have a peace broker agreement, but it, it just, it, it was never reality. It, it, they they should have never even tried to dabble with their war in China before all of that, to say the least. Well, and they they were uh, cursed by a, a lot of things, uh, most okay. notably hubris, because they you know um, one of the I forgot which of the uh, the guys that was at both at Pearl Harbor and at Midway said that they uh, they had Egypt. they were they were yeah they were uh, cursed by victory disease because mm -hmm. they hadn't lost anything at, at, up to that point in time. Well, they lost some at Coral Sea, but not significantly. Yep. So. Ad Admiral uh, Toichi Nagumo had been part of many, almost all the grand victories, the yep. Indian Ocean Raid, Pearl Harbor and everything. Although he was, you know, there's a lot of people that will point fingers to, <laughs> at him to say that he had failed in a lot of ways to do uh, less damage than he could have. Well, you know that for sure, and particularly with respect to the uh, uh, the oil storage on uh, at Pearl Harbor. But if you look at what N N uh, Nagumo did, uh, he followed Japanese doctrine almost, uh, uh, you know, perfectly. And so it's he kind of hard to say. Guy. Yeah, he was an absolute by the books guy. And uh, so you know, I think uh, we are probably much better informed now than we were, uh, say, when we made the the, the first. Midway movie in 1976. A lot of academic oh, yeah. uh, study has been done since then, and so we've we've learned quite a bit. And, and Nagumo comes out better now than he than he did in the past. Some of that's, that's uh, because of uh, of the book Shattered Sword. That was well, Shattered Sword made. changed a lot. Shattered Sword before Toll before he told yeah. his books. Shattered Sword was the go to for Midway. Yeah, absolutely. And it's almost tedious to read because it's got. Oh, some, yeah so many facts in it, it, it is midway by the minute yeah it is exactly that by the way one of the things that one of the docents on the hornet did was uh he after after i came back from um making the movie he thought i'm going to get all of the logs for all of the carriers on uh at the battle of midway and so we have a tome now uh that's called action reports that the, the uh, we sell on the on on hornet that is a uh, a compilation of all of the ship, all of the carrier logs for that period of time uh, during uh, uh, World War II, and it's it's kind of fascinating, you know, have, having written or having signed a lot of logs. I, I didn't write them actually; a quartermaster wrote them, but having signed a lot of them, it was kind of fascinating for me to see them all. <laughs> One interesting piece of information I came across when I had to do some more recent research, as you said, when it comes to the attack on Pearl Harbor, about the oil installations that were above uh, ground that Nagumo mm -hmm. could have struck if he had done the third strike. Someone, uh, I, this was in a forum, um, so I don't know his name or anything, he had argued that because of the armaments of the planes in question, the valves, and uh, even the strafing by zeros, 
he was arguing that they would have been hard pressed to actually cause damage to the oil facilities. And if they managed to light one on fire, they would not be able to get it to light the others on fire because apparently the fire control teams on Pearl Harbor were so good that the argument in the end was that the third strike would not have accomplished taking out the oil. I huh. thought that was interesting. I never heard that in my life. I I have not heard that before either. Uh, you know, I know that Nimitz was uh, one of the things he said was a mistake is that they didn't take out the oil. So, I, you know, but that may very well be true. But I, you know, and it's fascinating to to speculate about that. That you know, uh, I, I I'm kind of astonished at, at at that as well. I would have thought that you know in 1941. Uh, we wouldn't have been that good, you know. Because every everything I've ever read my whole life is if Nagumo had done the third strike, yep. perhaps yep. they could have bought themselves a few more want months and they would have rained more in the Pacific. Uh, but when you take that into consideration, if it is true that they were hard-pressed to actually do that kind of damage, maybe Nagumo might have been right about the risk involved in sticking around too long because yes, some of the aircraft carriers in the United States could have actually found them. Um, it was unlucky that they didn't, of course, but, uh, or maybe it was fortunate for the Americans. I don't know if they would have been a good situation if they ran into yeah. the tie. That, that, that might've been problematic for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously uh, Nim or, uh, Halsey being Halsey wanted to do that. Oh but, yeah, uh, he wanted it. <laughs> guessed uh, guessed wrong based on on uh, the, the technology of the day radar gave you a bilateral uh, direction on yeah. on uh, radar return so you know you're either either north or south but you know you don't you don't know which oh and of course to go back to your question about the turning point of the pacific war of which i think there's no one who's who's going to sit here and say there isn't many of course, the Battle of Midway is a turning point, but as uh, many, many guys who are much wiser than me have argued, it didn't change the initiative of the Japanese at that point, because the Japanese still cl were claiming more territory. And then when the naval battles happen in Guadalcanal, that's kind of when the real turn happens, where the Japanese have completely, ha they have to turtle up and become completely defensive. And yeah, uh, uh... it's just doom for them. And that's true. And, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, the Doolittle do Raid that, that people don't know about is that because of the Doolittle Raid, the Japanese actually pulled aircraft uh, mm -hmm. back to the to the island of uh, the islands of Japan in order to yeah. uh, prevent being embarrassed again. So in some respects, the um, the Doolittle Raid uh, made a considerable difference. But, the, you know, the main thing about Midway was, with the exception of you know the Japanese trying to retake Guadalcanal uh, from August to uh, April, August of '42 to April of '43. Uh, Once uh, Midway happened, uh, they they didn't they no longer expanded. They started contracting in the Central Pacific at that point in time, and then basically had a Central Pacific uh, uh, mindset uh, for the for the remainder of the war until things like the Mariana started to be lost and, and that sort of thing. So. But you know, I, I I agree with you, Craig. That you know, for the most part, the uh, the savvy and and not uh, overly enthusiastic uh, Japanese high command uh, was pretty well aware of the fact that uh, they they had to win it and they had to win it quickly if they were going to do it. And so, uh, once they didn't get the carriers at, at, at Pearl Harbor, uh, the, yeah, and take out, you know, I I think they would have had to do both things: take out the oil facilities and at Pearl as well as the aircraft carriers that that might have bought them enough time to be uh, so that the U.S. Uh, wouldn't have uh, pursued a complete defeat of Japan in World War II. But again, speculation, but that's what makes interest, history interesting is, you know, what if uh, is, is, is pretty dramatic in a, in a lot of cases. So uh, and certainly um, Yamamoto had a had a pretty good insight into that. He he knew more about uh, the U.S. than most of his contemporaries did. And, and but, yeah, but you know the 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 thing that you have to say is that uh, we had problems with inner service kinds of of things during World War II. I mean, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were established in World War II to try to start mitigating that. Yeah, the Japanese had that 
problem through the in war Spain. between them. Yeah. It, yeah, it was the army versus the navy all the time, and of course the the army uh, also had the advantage of having Tojo being the prime minister at the same time. So yeah, you know, lots of interesting aspects of of uh, that that entire uh, period of time. One of my uh, favorite stories is when Yamamoto's superior before World War II happened sends him out to sea to save his life because the army was going to assassinate him. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and pretty unpopular common. guy with the army for sure. Oh, yeah, he he was an ex he was a very flamboyant, extravagant man who loved gambling and all sorts of stuff. And girls and oh, and geishas. Uh, oh yes, particularly one one geisha that he's infamous had for a long time. Yeah, it was a huge public relations issue when uh she showed up to the funeral <laughs> yeah. oh. a little bit embarrassing one would think yes yeah but uh, certainly unlike a lot of uh his colleagues yamamoto had received a good a very good education when he went to the united states and he he did something that a lot of them didn't he toured factories he actually saw a ford yeah, factory he was like jerica in that regard you know f yeah. found out where things were yeah that was you know one of the things that i Excuse me. I'll go for it. One of the things that, that uh, impressed me uh, from a statistical standpoint is during World War II, the Japanese uh, expanded their war industry by a factor of three. So they were doing three times as much stuff as they were uh, you know, in the middle of the war as they were doing at, at the uh, beginning of the war. The United States from a much, much larger base expanded 20 times. So that just, you know, the inevitability of, of, of the end is, you know, it's pretty much stated by those, those two numbers. Yeah. Germany expanded something like seven times, you know, so it was, it was dramatic as well, but, you know, but, you know, the United States in that time period, uh, you know, just had lots and lots of everything. <laughs> so. And even when it came to the Japanese high command, who uh, I'll call them the ones that weren't as intelligent, who misjudged the production capability of the United States, even Adolf Hitler and his inner circle. Well, there was a few people who understood the United States a bit better, but he made the mistake also believing the United States didn't have the production capability it did, nor would it be willing to go the lengths that it did during World War II. So it's funny that two of the Axis members made the same mistake. You know, one of the things that uh, when you when you look at that whole that whole war, uh, allegedly, and I don't know that anybody can prove this, but allegedly Hitler was livid at the fact that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor because he wasn't given yes. any. Uh, he wanted to defeat Britain before any, the United States got involved in it. But you no, know, okay, livid. But then why why declare war in the United States in, uh, on December 11th? That you know incredible that's yeah that's just you know well i guess that says a lot about uh, a lot about hitler he, he he played it by ear completely and the 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 uh ribbentrop the german guy that was in the east uh for diplomacy uh hitler had him begging the japanese for months and months to help with the ba uh the uh barbarossa operation yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he had always foresaw. Okay, the Japanese will attack somewhere like Vladivostok. Uh, they'll take whatever parts of Siberia, and uh, well, Russia will crumble. the The door, as he, you know, it's a rotting structure, and he'll just kick in the door. And that's one of the most hard pressed questions I get from my audience all the time: is the idea of uh, what if Japan had gone through with the original plans uh, from the Imperial Japanese Army's perspective to uh, attack with the Kwangtung Army up into Siberia? And uh, for all the research I've done for quite a long time now, most people that are specialists in it, better than me, say it would have made no difference. That the Japanese uh. would not have the logistical capability on the land to actually make a dent. That is truly interesting. Uh, you know, uh, you're absolutely right about von Ribbentrop trying to do that, and and that was allegedly, uh, you know, part of the uh, part of the planning that uh, that Hitler was trying to bring. The other thing that's interesting about all of that is, and I, I'm going to miss a name now, but the, the the Japanese ambassador to Berlin, Baron. It was. Um, well, it doesn't make any difference what his name was. He was a uh, chatty Cathy. 
and <laughs> the U.S. had broken the purple code long before they were able to read any of the uh, naval code, and so they could read everything that that uh, the Baron was sending back to Tokyo, and apparently he wrote extensive reports. So. Uh, we knew a whole lot about what Germany was doing as a result of being able to read what Baron X's uh, yeah. reports were to Tokyo, which is kind of interesting. And so, you know, there's there's so many intriguing parts yeah. about World War II that are that are not well known and you know oh, yes. haven't been haven't been written about uh, in any kind of uh, um, credible academic kind of uh, research done in, in some of those areas that is, you know all of it's fascinating and so you can go on for hours and hours about uh, about world war ii and and uh, you know in particular uh, i like to speculate as i did in in our discussion today about things that might have happened if you know there were slightly different circumstances like do little raid didn't take place but we go to coral sea with uh with all of our assets and things like that uh, what if, if Baron X didn't wasn't such a chatty Cathy? What would we not have known about uh, that we did know about and things like that? You know. What if the Japanese won the Battle of the Midway? Yeah, exactly. That would have been a disastrous effect. Well, I we we've done this for quite a while now. I was wondering if maybe perhaps to finish it off, would you like to say something about the museum? Uh, what people could expect if they visit? Well, one of the things that uh, that we pride ourselves on is uh, we have a docent cadre that uh, that interprets the, the the ship and tries to bring it uh, to life. Uh, recently, uh, we were talking about uh, what kind of a mode would we like to uh, have as we think about coming out of COVID and you know sort of um, rededicating the museum and you know our 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 mindset prior to to COVID was kind of, we would like to present the ship as uh, though the sailors had just left yesterday. So one of our things is that we have, we have preserved the Hornet uh, in its state in 1970 when it went out of service. Uh, our, our recent mantra is, no, that's not quite what we'd like. What we would like is that the guys are still here. And this is the way the ship uh, was w with all of the sailors on board. Now that's a little bit hard to bring off, uh, but that's the kind of way we, we, we like to present the ship. So we have uh, 14 decks and levels that you can tour uh, with docents. So we go all the way down to the uh, fifth deck, it's really a, not a deck at that point, it's a platform, but nonetheless, we go down to that level and we uh, have two levels of the fire room to, to show people and we have uh, number one and number four engines that we can show to people down in the engineering spaces. We have things like the tailor shop and the cobbler shop open and that blows people's minds sometimes to say, you know, an aircraft carrier has a tailor shop and a cobbler shop. Well, yeah, they, uh, you know, they needed to have clothes uh, fixed and they and they needed to have uh, you know shoes resold and rehealed, and if you have thirty five hundred people on board, it's pretty much a small city. So you have all of the yeah. all of those things. Um, at any rate, that you know if we, if we're down in the third deck, you, you can see things like the cobbler shop and the tailor shop and the and the ship's laundry, which could handle thirty five hundred men, and then you go all the way up to primary flight control, which is uh, uh, five levels above the flight deck. And so all of that uh, is available to the public. And, you know, I, I will maintain, and I think anybody that's associated with the Hornet would maintain that it's probably the best restored ship that you will find of, of that vintage. We have probably our largest volunteer group are the guys that do the ship restoration. And uh, they they continue to work on things, and uh, you know, so we get obscure places like uh, forward auxiliary engineering space that they're. Um, so we're going to be able to see the evaporators that we actually uh, distilled oh. water from, and things like that. Uh, we are working on uh, opening uh, what's called the special weapons locker, which is where the nuclear weapons were stored on on, wow. on board Hornet. Uh, so. It is uh, r really remarkable how much space that we have uh, that is uh, open to the public on, on docent-led tours. The other thing that is unique about the Hornet is there's 
one currently one museum within a museum and it will soon be two museums within a museum the one that we have now is a museum that is uh, managed by veterans of the 442nd regimental combat team and the, the 100 uh, military intelligence uh, service uh, so the nisai soldiers that, that served in particularly in europe we have a museum uh, above hangar bay three that is dedicated to them and it's got uh, five or six rooms of of really interesting stuff about uh, the internment of the japanese during world war ii and then the the success of the of the second generation Japanese soldiers that, that particularly fought in Europe, most decorated unit in the uh, in U.S. military history. So yeah. we can do things because of the uh, the uh, immense size of an aircraft carrier. We can do things like museums within a museum. So to some extent, you can get that with a little piece of the museum. There's sort of a little do little museum within a museum, and. Uh, um, we, we, we're just trying to be as authentic as we can, and we're trying to make it as interesting as we can. And, you know, basically, when we talk to docents we and, and train a new docent, we tell them that the secret to being a docent is to be a good plagiarist. If you hear a good, if you hear a good sea story um, by one of your colleagues, and you adopt that as being part of your repertoire, and you don't have to say this happened to me, you can say one of my colleagues talks about, you know, and so you get uh, some of the fun parts and some of the really interesting and, and exciting and terrifying aspects of that, depending on the circumstances um, that you can convey to people. So we're really proud of what we're what we've done and what we're doing, and and we're hoping to be able to keep it going for for a while. One of the one of the hardships that we face is that you know my generation is is going away slowly and so we don't really have people that served we won't soon have people that actually served on mm. on ships like hornet yeah. um, we have quite a few today that either flew off of one or like myself served as ship's company on one but no that's that's not destined for all time so we have to figure out a way that we can uh, get people able to tell the stories in a way that makes it interesting for the public and yeah. That's our objective is to keep it really interesting. We also, you know, uh, have to deal with uh, or, or are fortunate to be able to deal with all the things that are associated with Sp Apollo and the space program. And so, mm, yes. um, you know, we we uh, have educational classes. We do STEM classes for, you know, anything from K through 12. And it's really, you know, if you're going to teach somebody uh, something about aerodynamics, it, it is really an interesting place to do that because you get more focus on, you know, these guys actually flew airplanes and here's how an airplane took off of a carrier and here's how a catapult works and here are the, the dynamics of, of, of uh, flight in, in that circumstance or steam turbines or jet turbines or, you know, any number of other things, hydraulics and, and pneumatics even to, to that extent. So you get that kind of snap focus connect uh, Thing with your with your STEM programs, and then, you know, one of, I'll just give you a paid political announcement on my own part here. One of the things that we despair about is that you know, schools in in the United States aren't teaching much about civics and history anymore. And so, I'd imagine you know, one of our one of our things is, you know, okay, we have we have history classes on the Hornet, and we teach you about World War II, or we teach you about the Cold War, or uh, those kinds of things. So it's a combination of it's the it's the fourth most the fourth biggest event center in the Bay Area. So you know, uh, the Hangar Bay we've had or in the Hangar Bays we've had things that you know like um, Nvidia had a had 200 computers on on there with her with a new uh, card that they had uh, they were introducing and we had things like that. We have we've had 3,000 people from Google on board to to have a, a holiday party. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's a lot of things to a lot of people and, and uh, you know, we were, were able to handle a lot of interesting private events and we were able to handle a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, classes in history and, and STEM and, you know, uh, we're, we're pretty versatile. We're pretty small staff, but we, we managed to do a lot of things. And if you were to look at the organization chart, you would find out that the staff had about probably 25 people in the 
the volunteers are probably 10 times that much. So it's a largely volunteer centric kind of an organization, but it's a fun place to, to, to be a volunteer at. And so if you're in the Bay Area or any place close to it and you're interested in, in history and science and whatever, and you have the gift of gab or you think you do, uh, or if you like to restore ships or aircraft, uh, we just recently restored a, a, an S2 we were talking about earlier, uh, an S2 uh, dedicated to the only S2 that we lost off the Hornet during the Vietnam uh, era. And so we've just restored one. It looks, it looks like it just came out of the factory. And uh, all, all of those things are part of what it takes to be a, a really good museum. And we're trying as hard as we can to be a really good museum. Excellent to hear. So for everyone listening, please go check out the USS Hornet Museum. Thank the you USS so Hornet, USS-Hornet.org. You have to remember the dash, USS-Hornet.org. You'll find a lot of things there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chuck. It's been excellent. This has been a lot of fun. And I honestly, I learned a lot from this. Well, um, I learned some things too, Craig, and I appreciate the, the time that you were able to to devote to this and so if you have an idea about what you want to do uh, you know, that i can contribute to again please ask because i'd be a, absolutely I'd enjoy being a part of it you're the first i'll come to thank you so much oh you're more than welcome take care this has been the pacific war podcast week by week over and out <laughs>